guys said, can we help? He's like, can we open these doors? And Thanks. Father God, I thank you that we can come before you in prayer. And I thank you that we can gather together this group of friends and study your word together. I pray for Shannon's brother um, and whether he needs prayer for health or safety traveling and on the missions trip, you know what he needs right now. And I just pray for that. I pray for the struggles of our hearts and minds. I pray for Stacy's mom as she's um, fighting sickness as well. And, and um, I just pray that you would help us to take from your word today, what you would have us to learn about you in your name. I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, okay. So Stacy, can you read verses one through three, please? Today's Bible reading is coming out of a Bible I found in my dad's garage that he had hidden out there. And what is wild is I looked inside of it and it, which now I feel really bad. That's why I'm going to read it today. When I was in high school, as a freshman, there was a senior that we became friends because we were both in ROTC. He would take me to Grace Community Church. No way. Don't youth, youth group. Well, once he graduated, I lost my ride, so I couldn't go to church anymore. This is, I think, his dad's Bible wow. that somehow got borrowed, and oh. he must have left it in the garage. So I, I found him on Facebook, and I want to try to find a way to return it to him, but I thought I'd give it one more go <laughs> before I return it. Wow, that's cool. Kind of, but yeah, cool. I found it. I found it in the garage when I'd gone out to look for something. And so he's he was reading it. Wow. That's Until awesome. All the pages were turned and he was reading it. So I thought that was cool. Very cool. Very awesome. So one through three, please. Three. Okay. Let us say to the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my short is that ah goodness, my is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a wilderness, their fish sinketh because there is no water and dieth for thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. And crazy Godwink, my first quote is from McGar John MacArthur, where though the sufferings of Judah were the necessary results of sin, no certificate of divorce or sale to creditors occurred because Zion's separation from the Lord was only temporary. In fact, God gave the non-Devetic Nor Northern Kingdom a certificate of divorce, and that's from Jeremiah 3, 8 did I if um and okay. then and I'll have you go ahead and read that somebody got that I gave faithful faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear she also went out and committed adulteries however the unconditional promise of the Davidic covenant second Samuel 7 12 through 16 Okay. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendants after you who will come forth from you. And I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him. So I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall it endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established forever. Okay, so here is the promise of the covenant precluded such a divorce for Judah, although there would be a time of separation. And we're going to see that time of separation in a few of these chapters where it's going to be talked about. J. Vernon McGee, under the Mosaic law, um, that's from Deuteronomy 24.1, a man could put away his wife on the slightest pretext. A cruel and hard-hearted man would take advantage of this to get rid of his wife. God asked Israel if they know on what grounds he set them aside. Certainly God is not cruel or brutal. Israel is spoken of as the wife of Jehovah. This is the theme of Hosea. It was not a whim of God that caused Israel to be set aside, but God makes it very clear that their sin brought about their rejection. Um, and then I saw this and thought it was so interesting. Um, or there may be another sense. 
this is just a, this was so cool. Um, here the Lord compares himself to a man and a father of a household who is treated shamefully by his own wife and children. When he came home, there was no one to welcome him. And when he called, no one to answer him. Hence, he who had the right to all their respect was treated as one without any rights. Um, I just thought that was really interesting too. It's like, man, that's like a different take on that. Um, verse two, God expressed wonder though the children, God's people did not expect redemption. He did not get moving on the list. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't <laughs> know. I'm trying to keep my kids moving towards we have to leave for my sisters today because tomorrow we're going to the Nutcracker and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. <laughs> um, so God's people did not expect redemption. He did not divorce Zion and he did not sell his people to a creditor so he could get them back. Further, God is certainly powerful enough to save them. The act of drying up the waters reflects the ancient Near Eastern, Eastern understanding that the waters stood for the forces of chaos. God controlled them and would decimate them at will. His control in the waters is a reference to his redeeming arm. Recall the Exodus. So uh, verse three. So this was such a huge game changer. So verse three, I dress the heavens in black and make sackcloth their, their covering. Sackcloth was a rough material. We talked about this, I think last week. Um, irritated to the skin, worn as part of mourning rites. The heavens mourn because of God's acts of judgment. Now check this out. Um, the last, so this is from Spurgeon and Spurgeon relates this to the crucifixion. The last miracle recorded here, namely that of covering the heavens with sackcloth was performed by our Lord, even when he was in the death agony. We read that at high noon, the sun was veil veiled and there was darkness all over the land for three black hours. Wonder of wonders, he, he who hung bleeding there had wrought that mighty marvel. The sun had looked upon him hanging on the cross and as if in horror had covered its face and traveled on its tenfold night. The tears of Jesus quenched the light of the sun. Had he been wrathful, he might have put out its light forever. But his love not only restored that light, but it was it has given to us a light a thousand times more precious, even the light of everlasting life and joy. Oh, I love that. I just loved that the way he, he took that scripture and just made it so awesome. Um, so can somebody read Luke 23, 44 through 46? So we got it. Almost there. I got distracted. Okay. okay. 44 through 46. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, father into your hands, I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Okay, so we see the veil is torn. And here we see the sackcloth is torn. And so that to me is just so cool how those two just kind of go together. And like how in the world and everything was black, the veil was torn, it, the darkness came. And it just was so stinking cool how those go hand in hand um, of the crucifix. I mean, how in the world so I think Matthew Henry sums up this so well. Those who have professed to be people of God and seem to be dealt severely with are amped to complain as if God had been hard with them. Here is an answer for such murmurings. God never deprived any of their advantages except their sins. The Jews were sent into Babylon for their idolatry, a sin which broke the covenant, and they were at last rejected for crucifying the Lord our God, our, sorry, the Lord of glory. God called on them to leave their sins and prevent their own ruin. Last of all, the son came into his own, but his own received him not. When God calls men to happiness and they will not answer, they are just left to, to be miserable. To silence doubts concerning his power, proofs of, all, of it are given. The wonders which attended his sufferings and death proclaim that he was the son of God. Um, I just thought that was a good wrap up of those three verses. Does anybody have anything on those? 
There's a lot jam packed in those three, isn't there? So do you think that's where wearing black for morning comes from? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I just really love all the places where it talks about like heavens, like the heavens and everything being someplace that God can just like draw a curtain across it. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> like a window, whatever. Yeah. It just it's amazing to me. Yeah. I mean, who knew that these three verses there's just so, I mean, I just like, I don't know. It's me. It's like, whenever you dive into God's word is he has so many nuggets, like so many like little things that we can see that are just so amazing. It's like one of those, I was like, oh, this is so awesome. Okay. Anybody else have anything? We'll get to the next section. Uh, Stacey, can you read verses four through seven, please? Okay. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh morning by morning, he waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. <clears throat> okay, so verse four and five, the first person speaker, me, is the servant. The servant ultimately is identified with Christ, though the original audience probably identified the servant as purified Israel. Alternately, a number of scholars identify the servant in this poem as Isaiah. The speaker is a student of God trained to provide encouragement to those who are weary. Each morning, God awakens him with new insight. So I, I do think that this could go both ways on here. It says the Messiah prophetically speaks of his daily wonder, deep fellowship with God, the father. It is in these times that Jesus heard from his father that he could say he awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Messiah could speak with the tongue of the learned, because in daily time with God, he learned to hear as he learned. Uh, verse six, if somebody can pull up the Matthew passage um, while I read this, that would be great. Uh, verse six, anticipating a fuller development in 52, 13 through 53, 12, the servant is one who suffers, though God will keep him from shame. Allusions to this verse are found in Matthew 26, 67 and 2730 if somebody can read that i can grab it then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists and others slapped them him <clears throat> they spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head oh man so that just when doing this it just it just oh it just hurts me to think that jesus had to go through this and verse six shows that right? We see Jesus was beaten in his back um, and how they spit on him and everything. It's just so, so horrible what they did to him. Um, the Messiah prophetically speaks of his daily wonder, deep fellowship with God, the father. And it is in these times that Jesus heard from his father that he could say, he awakens my ear to hear as they the learned. The Messiah could speak the tongue of the learned because of Oh, I already read that. Sorry. Um, verse seven, in the midst of all this suffering, humiliation and pain, the Messiah has an unshakable confidence in the help of the Lord God. So can we have the same confidence in God? It is pitiful for the Christian to re refuse to suffer and to become a fighting man crying. We must stand up for our rights. Did you ever see Jesus in that posture? Instead, trust in the Lord and proclaim for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will, I have set my face like a flint. Despite knowing the agony awaiting him, the Messiah will have a steadfast determination to obey the Lord God and follow his way. His face will be set as hard as a flint and nothing will turn him aside. This was exactly fulfilled in the life of Jesus, who was determined to go to Jerusalem, even knowing what waited for him there. Now it comes to pass when the time had come for him to be received that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that was Luke 9.51. There are two kinds of courage. The courage of the moment, which are, requires no previous thought, and a planned courage, which sees the difficulty ahead and steadfastly marches towards it. 
Jesus had this kind of courage. He could see the cross on the horizon, but still set his face like a flint. Spurgeon has a wonderful sermon um, called The Redeemer's Face Set Like a Flint. And these are his heading and points. How the steadfast resolves of Jesus was tested by offers from the world, by the persuasions of his friends, by the unworthy of his clients, by the bitterness of the first few drops of suffering in Gethsemane, by the ease at which he could have backed out if he had wished to, by the taunts of those who mocked him, by the full stress of agony of the cross, how the steadfast resolve of Jesus was sustained by his divine schooling, by his conscious innocence, by his unshakable confidence and help of God, by the joy that was set before him, how to imitate the steadfast resolve of Jesus. And when there is something right, stand for it. When you have a right purpose that glorifies God, carry it out. Um, there are so many things in these. I was like looking at that and I found a Spurgeon thing and it was so long. My ADHD was like, oh, there's no way I'm reading that this morning. It was so long, but it was, I, it was like the notes of this. And whenever I found like somebody had did this, I was like, oh, that makes it so much easier. Um, but this is so true. And if we see, I really like the first sentence of this, where it says, can we have the same confidence in God? You know, it's like, we, we do have it so easy in the U S I mean, we do not have persecution. We just don't. I mean, yes, we can get persecuted in ways and stuff, but it's not physical. It's not like we're in Indonesia where whenever I was there, where we could at any moment, there was caught, like the police were going right back and forth and, and they could at any moment come down and the pastor there knew at any moment there, they could drag him down the steps and put a gun to his head. And that was just, that was just what could have happened. And in the pastor was like, we always have to be ready to tell gospel always, always. You know, we don't have that here. I mean, um, and I don't know if we'll get that way, but you see here, um, it says it is pitiful for the Christian to reuse, uh, refuse to suffer and to become a fighting man crying. We must stand up for our rights. And I see this, do you like, instead trust in the Lord and proclaim for the Lord, God will help me. We do have to trust in the Lord. And no matter what we go through, if persecution does end up coming to this country, you know, are we strong enough to stand for that? Are we strong enough in our faith to say, no matter what, I will follow God. Um, I just got done reading God Smuggler and that was, God, that was such a great book. Like it was, Faith read it first and she's like, mom, you got to read this, you know? And in that book, like you just see, he's relentless. He just, he saw the need for the God's word to be in countries where the, they were um, closed. And he, by God's grace, I mean, this man is amazing. He's still alive too, I think. Um, but we see in that, that he, he, his, he didn't care. He didn't care where his life was going to, was going to happen. He knew God's call in his life. And that's where we just have to do. We have to see where God, where is God calling us in our life? And what does he want us to do? And, and to just do that. Um, and sometimes it's easier said than done, but, um, it may not make sense to the world, but we need to stand firm into what God's word says, um, and if we're not there, we can at least um, financially support people who are. And so, and I know, like, I always say, like, sacrifice, sometimes giving in fi financial sacrifice. Um, so we, like, know somebody who can't fly. He can't fly in a plane. He gets sick. He's not able to. But he, he financially helps people go on mission trips because he would love to go on a mission trip, but he can't. So he helps people go. And so, like, that's just really cool. So you can just see where in your finances, where can God guide you to give, um, if you're not physically able to go or anything like that. So, um, does anybody have anything on that section? Oh, thank you, Jennifer. I'm glad you're out of the hospital. I hope you're okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? We, yes. Thank you. Yes. It wasn't contagious. It was heart related, but I just, my boss has been calling me to work every day that I've been out doing stuff from home. So I'm, I'm praying for a time to just rest, <laughs> but I was like, not today, Satan. I'm going to this <laughs> online Bible study. <laughs> yeah. Thank that's crazy. <laughs> Does your boss know that you're sick? Like, <laughs> Oh yeah. She knows I was in the hospital for hypertension crisis and squeezing chest pains. Oh my goodness. Yeah. She's, she's a unique person. <laughs> wow. 
should put your email right. autoresponder for today that you are available after X time that this Bible study ends and that all messages will be <laughs> responded to then. Um, I just love what you said about, about courage of the moment versus planned courage. Like when you know you have to face something that's impossible, you know, that Jesus had to face that impossible and he knew what it was going into it. And I just, it's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, and that could even be with conversations with people. Um, I have to brag on my husband. Like he, Saturday, he went to go get his haircut and he gets his haircut like at this, like it's called a med mall where they do like medical stuff. But he, get, he gets it done on Saturday. He goes on Saturday and he was leaving and there was this older lady and she was just sitting by the door and he just kind of said, do you need something? And she's like, I really need a ride home. And so he ended up giving her a ride home and helped her, got her lunch and everything. And it was just like, that was so not normally his personality. That's like more something I would do, but I was just really proud of him because like he just really was spirit led on that. And he just saw the Lord guiding that conversation and guiding that relationship. And he called me to tell me he was going to be late. And she, she talked and um, I, I was like talking to her and stuff. And it was just really awesome how just even in that moment, just using those opportunities to um, help others and to pour into them and everything. Um, you never know what God can do whenever you just pray, you know, Lord, my schedule is yours, you know, and I've enjoyed this week because I haven't been as busy with work. And so I, it was like, just really cool just to be able to say, okay, God, like my schedule is yours. Like I'm not rushed this week finally. And so I can enjoy just being able to be in conversations with people and stuff. And so that's just really been awesome. So does anybody else have anything on that section? Okay, we're going to finish off the chapter. Remember, I did this so I could get done early. So I was <laughs> planning on getting done early today. So we may still get done early. Um, if you can read verses 8 through 11, Stacey, that'd be great. Okay. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my mine adversary? adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he? that shall condemn me lo they shall they all shall wax old as a garment the moth shall eat them up who is among you that feareth the lord that obeyeth the voice of his servant that walketh in darkness and hath no light let him trust in the name of the lord and stay upon his god behold all ye that kindle your fire that compass yourselves about with sparks walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that ye have kindled this shall ye have of mine hand you shall lie down in sorrow. So verse eight, um, Warren Rearsby adds, keep in mind that when Jesus Christ was ministering here on earth, he had to live by faith, even as we must today. He did not use his divine power selfishly for himself, but trusted God and depended on the power of the spirit. And that was just really cool to think about, you know, it's like, man, you know, it's like some of these things I just never have thought about. Um, God is the one who pronounces his servant righteous. And of course, God is the only one who can pronounce sinful men and women righteous in his eyes. And then only if they believe in the one or sorry, the only inherently innately righteous one, his servant, the Messiah. Um, verse nine, this is also declared to be true in, um, of the heavens themselves. Did somebody, can somebody get Hebrews? Did I put that on there? I didn't. Can somebody get Hebrews 1, 10 through 12? Or I guess I can. Sorry. So Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. And in the beginning... Lord, you establish the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak and they will be changed like clothing. But you are the same and your years never will never end. So if Christ shall indeed survive to see the end of the side real universe, infinitely less would be the chances that any of his earthly foes would outlast the Lord. 
The idea here is that the Messiah would survive all their attacks, his cause, his truth, and his reputation would live, while all the power, influence, and reputation of his adversaries would vanish like a garment that is worn out and thrown away. So this is verses four through nine. As Jesus was God and man in one person, we find him sometimes speaking or spoken of as the Lord God, at other times as man and the servant of Jehovah. He was to declare the truth which comfort the broken, contrite heart, those weary of sin, harassed with afflictions. And as the Holy Spirit was upon him, that he might speak as never man spake. So the same divine influence daily wakened him to pray, to preach the gospel, and to receive and deliver the whole or while will of the Father. The Father justified the Son when he accepted the satisfaction he made for the sin of man. Christ speaks in the name of all believers. Who dares to be an enemy for those unto whom he is a friend? Or who will contend with those whom he is an advocate? Can somebody read uh, Romans 8.33? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Yep. So verse 10, a human fears the Lord when he understands that God is far superior and that man is a mere creature. Such fear does not lead to flight, but to a trust that can depend on God for protection. The person who fears the Lord listens to what the servant of the Lord says. And this is so true. We as believers have that light to guide our paths, that Jesus is the light. When we are in bondage, the darkness surrounds us. I know for me personally, I was in a dark place before coming to Christ, and I tried so hard to fill that void. Um, I had anger issues, identity issues, and I had no idea my worth. I lived in the past and only lived for the moment. But that moment, I surrendered truly and said, okay, Lord, my life is yours. I have to say all that slowly left. I reconciled with my dad. I realized my worth is in Christ, not in man. And I most of all saw he forgave me all the awful things that I had done, yet he forgave me. So to say he is the light, he is, and so much more. And I think that that, that is why I love seeing these attributes so much in here. We see the attributes. I love whenever we do all of these because we can see how all of these names of God that we have that we can call upon and that he is, the attributes that he does and that he has done. Um those are the things that we need to fall upon whenever we are in that dark place. Cause we go through those, those dark nights of the soul and we struggle with things and we end up and we can allow the enemy to keep us in that, or we can just repent and turn from that. Sometimes you need people to hold you accountable for that. Sometimes you need accountability partners. Sometimes you need people to come into your life and meet with you every like once a week and, or so, and and that's what we are called to do as believers. We are called to do to do that and to be there for others. Um, and that is something I'm really like trying to make my schedule more open for is to allow um, me to meet with more people and and everything, and not to just take my time and selfishly uh, to use it for what I want, but to see what God if He has those God appointments set out. Uh, verse 11, opposite of the one who fears the Lord and leans on him is the self-reliant person who tries to create light by his own hand. He kindles his own fire to produce light. Such people will experience torment from God. Those who light fires refers to men who had their own schemes and their own gods because they had rejected the light of the God's word. They would face terrible punishment. Torment is only found here, but it's verb guarantees its meaning of grief, pain, and displeasure. Even the place of pain, specifically the pain of sin, surrendered the curse of God. You can do it your way, but this is what happens. And so I once heard a sermon by Stephen Davies and he had said, and it kind of, it really did like change, like really obviously it, stick to, it stuck with me this whole time, but eventually like people don't say this, but eventually if you reject God so much, eventually he does say, that's it you know, I'm done. And he will like, his hand will not be on you. Now is, is he always available for you to come back to him? Oh yeah. Like he's never going to leave you nor forsake you, but you can reject him. And, and that's what we're seeing a lot right now. We're seeing a lot of people rejecting him, a lot of people um, just turning away from him and everything. And so as believers, um, that's why we, you know, we, if we see people going down that path, we meet with them. We talk to them. We, we invest in them. Um, we, we don't just 
you know, I mean, I think sometimes for me, it's just like, oh, somebody else can handle that. <laughs> you know, I don't have time for that, you know, and, um, and so I think it's just really important as a body of Christ for us to meet with people, take our time, see where God wants, pray that God would send somebody for you to mentor um, and to pour into, and then have somebody pouring into you. It's always the, the Paul Timothy model um, that we should be in our lives. So does anybody have anything on that? You're talking about not thinking about how Jesus struggled on earth and didn't, um, you know, divinely provide for his own needs or whatever. And I've been doing a study with the kids by um, Nancy um, Lee Wolgamuth, used to be Lee Damas. Anyway, and it's based on some Christmas carols. And one of them was, thou didst leave thy throne. I don't know if any of you know this song. I grew up singing it in church. And it's old English language, but the third verse says the foxes found rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree, but thou, thy couch was sod, O thou son of God, in the deserts of Galilee. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart for thee. But it talks about that there's no room for him anywhere. But this, this hymn is so cool, this carol, because it talks about like his coming, his life on earth his going back to heaven, his coming back to earth. It's just really cool. So if you want to look up, thou didst leave thy throne. It's really awesome. But I love that verse that it talks about the foxes have a hole and the birds have a nest and God's God, when he came to earth, slept on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it just really, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about it a lot until that recently popped up too. Yeah, I miss old hymns. You know, I, I think churches need to should read old hymns or sing old hymns more and stuff. So well, since it's story time, <laughs> devotional for today was a lifetime of hope. No day is accidental or incidental, no acts are random or wasted. Look at the Bethlehem birth. A king ordered a census. Joseph was forced to travel. Mary, as round as a ladybug, bounced on a donkey's back. The hotel was full. The hour was late. The event was one big hassle. Yet out of the hassle, hope was born. It still is. I don't like hassles, but I love Christmas because it reminds us how God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. Romans 8:28. The heart-shaping promises of Christmas. Long after the guests have left and the carolers have gone home and the lights have come down, the promise these promises endure. Perhaps you could use some Christmas this Christmas. Let's do what I did as a six-year-old, red-headed, flat-top, freckle-faced boy. Let's turn on the lamp, curl up in a comfortable spot, and look into the odd, wonderful story of Bethlehem. May you find what I have found, a lifetime of hope. Very cool. Yeah. One thing I found was neat is like when Katie was saying that Jesus uh, was like sleeping on the ground is that Jesus is such an example to every single person or like every soul that ever lived on the earth. Like he's a king, but yet he was homeless. He had everything, but yet he had nothing. He was hurt and yet he was loved on. And it was just, it just so, when you look back, you're like, you can relate, you know, he can relate to every single person on the entire earth. It's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. And to think that if you look at the shepherd, like in the gate, whenever we went over that passage two years ago and how the shepherd would literally lay on the ground and it was like they, he was the gate and the sheep would never go past the shepherd because the, sh the shepherd, that's what, how he would sleep at night. He would sleep on the ground and the sheep never would leave because they were so loyal to the shepherd that when the, and so it's like, again, Jesus is our shepherd. We are the sheep. And so it kind of goes in with um, hearing what you and Katie were saying. It's like, he, he did that, you know, that's what he was the example for. Really cool. It's like, you just see all this and you just think how unworthy <laughs> it's all I keep on thinking of every chapter I'm reading, like the last week of this week, I'm like, oh, I'm so unworthy. <laughs> I like how in all the reading we've done this week, it's, I am God. I've never left you. I am God. I can do all the things. I am it's like this constant reminder. Okay. I hear you. I understand. Yeah. Like I had this pack of stickers on my desk and I hadn't opened it. 
And then there's this little one and it's a C.S. Lewis quote. And it says, I believe in Christ like I do the sun, not because I can see it, but by it, I can see everything else. Wow, that's really awesome. I was like, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's all I need is coffee and Jesus, which praise. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. But that just kind of not really summed it up. <clears throat> really cool. Well, does anybody have anything else? We are going to get done early today. That's like a record. It makes up for all the times we get done late. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, because I, of course, plan for that like for the the chapter I, I didn't do as much as I usually did I just didn't think to go back and look up more stuff there's so much on this chapter though it was really hard to pick pick and choose what to do so it's so good though y'all okay actually last night and why I had the we didn't have normal Alana last night because Wasa made it to district one x or state or whatever I don't know I don't follow it anyway. So I had the junior hires over. And so I read like an article that I had actually a story that I had memorized as a kid for a competition or whatever. And then I like opened Isaiah and read several different passages from Isaiah to them last night. It was kind of fun to do that. I just, I think it's so cool. We've been like, I said that we've been doing like things with faith at night of my husband's Sunday school lessons. And what he did is he took Genesis passages and revelation passages and like connected them. And it's like, it's so cool. Whenever these kids, the light comes on, you know, and it's like, Whoa, that does go with that. It's like so insane. Like how the first three chapters of Genesis go with the last three chapters of Re revelation. And, um, and that's what we've, we've just been reading them back and forth. That's all we're basically doing. And it's just been really awesome. Um, um, kids, kids seeing scripture, backing scripture up with scripture. And then if you were to show that them that on a timeline to show them how far apart it was written, that there was no way they would know. I think that would also kind of solidify yeah. the, some of the non-belief, which, you know, like I said, you can't, you are more of a non-believer until you actually, oh, I don't know, pick up a book and read it. Yeah. Just thoughts. Yeah. It's like the ones that, that protest the most have never actually read the Bible. So yeah, That's they true. just know, know what they've heard. Yeah. Welcome to every week when I'm at my mom's just saying, <laughs> yeah, it's she is wildly familiar with it because of my grandma. So like I, was, I texted, <laughs> there was a, a actual Bible category on jeopardy. So I lost my mind. I was like, yay, finally questions I can try to answer. And she, out of nowhere, there's my mom answering the questions. I'm like, look at you who's been reading their Bible. <laughs> Good job. That's awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Great. Okay, well, we can go ahead and pray. And Stacey had mentioned people share without being recorded. So we can um, stop recording after we pray and then we can chat a little bit. So does somebody want to pray us out? Anybody else want to be brave? <laughs> I I make my junior hires pray every week. Yeah, I know, right? It's like <laughs> I feel like this is the card. I feel like with it's like those cartoons. I'm gonna date myself, but remember how they used to have the like the long stick with the curve and they would pull somebody from off stage? I feel like that's what we do. Like we're doing Bible on the stage, and then every week it's like, oh quick, pull Katie. Here comes Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to pray us out, but if somebody else is willing, I'm happy for that. Not right now. <clears throat> All right. Okay, go ahead. God, I just thank you for how big you are and that you're here and that you are revealing yourself in scriptures that were inspired and written thousands of years ago. And I just, it's just amazing how powerful you are. I pray that you would help us as we go through our struggles this week and and the things going on that you would just show your power in a real way to each of us. I pray for healing for those who are sick and for guidance for all of us um, and the things that we're dealing with. And I just pray that you would bring us back together next week to learn more about you. In Jesus name, amen. Amen.